To unite the voices of people working in small-scale fisheries across the globe, we have created the Small-Scale Fisheries Hub, an interactive space for members to learn, share, and grow together. Joining the Hub connects you to a network of people from around the world. In the Community Forum, you can meet like-minded members, ask questions, and exchange ideas and resources. Together, we are building a community of people to support the governance and development of small-scale fisheries.
Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the latest of Blue Ventures Tocotello sessions, where we're sharing experiences from the front lines of community conservation. Uh, please say hello in the chat and let us know where you're from. My name's Abigail Ledbeater. I work for Blue Ventures in the monitoring and evaluation team. And today I'll be chairing this interactive discussion about how data can be used to empower communities in marine management. Today, we're hoping to show how collecting and sharing data is a key component in community-led management, as well as exploring some case studies in particular that use innovative techniques for data use and communication. To do this, we're really excited to bring together a diverse panel that can provide an insight into the importance of community-based data from very different contexts. Our speakers today are Marianne Teo from Flora and Fauna International, Lucy Kay, from the community of Aaron Seabed Trust and Nusi Musarati from Fulkani. I'd also like to welcome, welcome Hannah Gilchrist. She's a colleague of mine who also works in the m and &E team at Blue Ventures and she's co-chairing with me today, particularly helping out with the questions. But before we hear from our speakers, a little bit of a recap on today's session and its format and also some housekeeping. There's two parts. To today's event. In the first part, our speakers will talk us through their work and then we'll have a question and answer session at the end of all of the talks. So please submit your questions um, as we go along. Um, you can do that in the chat on the page, um, but you need to be signed into a YouTube account to be able to do that. Um, you can submit questions at any time. Um, but we'd really like it if you could direct them specifically to specific speakers. In the second part of our session today, um, for those of you that have registered, we'll be splitting out into three breakout groups with a chance to discuss some of the topics in greater detail. The first session is going to be recorded and available after um, for you to watch back and share with others. The breakout sessions won't be recorded but we'll be able to share written feedback um, from those sessions, as well as other resources from our speakers. All of that will be available on the Toco Tello website as soon as possible after this event. If you're facing any te technical problems, the best way uh, to get in touch is by emailing digital at blueventures.org, and there's somebody there that will be able to help you. And at the end, there'll be a short feedback questionnaire that you'll receive, and we'd really appreciate you taking a moment to fill it in. But now over to our speakers. Our first speaker is Marianne Teo. She's Marine Program Manager for Flora and Fauna International in Cambodia. Marianne is a Marine Environmental Scientist and Manager, and she's working with her team, communities, and partners to develop a network of marine protected areas across the country. Over to you, Marianne. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you can all hear me OK. I'm really excited to be here to present. So firstly, I'd like to thank the entire Blue Ventures team for hosting this and um, all of the team in Cambodia and our partners. So today, I would like to talk to you about smart patrols in Cambodia and how we're working with communities what's succeeded, what's been challenging. And towards the end, I'll talk a bit about how uh, complementary data types like social perceptions data, mapping and satellite data can, or how it's limited in helping empower community-led marine management. So just to the next slide. Um, the goal of our program is to protect marine biodiversity and strengthen resilience of coastal ecosystems and communities in Cambodia. So our whole team works really closely with five community groups in island locations and very closely with the government of Cambodia. For context, these are the sites. Um, you can see these islands towards the left. We've got towards the top left, the Kosadak Community Fishery, which is a locally managed marine area. And right in the center towards the left is Cambodia's first marine protected area, which is formed of three community groups coming together. Now, uh, these sites host coral reefs, seagrass, mangroves, um, and importantly, a home to about 980 to 1,000 island families who have predominantly fishing and fisheries-based livelihoods. 
These livelihoods are very under threat um, from IUU and destructive fishing, as is similar in the Gulf of Thailand, in which these sites sit. Um, and unregulated coastal development, tourism and land development is severely affecting the biodiversity and livelihoods too. So these sites are where we work and um, the focus of what I'll talk to you about today. Um, they're managed collaboratively by four community fishery groups and five patrol teams that are community-based, as well as the government and NGOs like ourselves. So what I'd like to um, focus on in this talk really is the smart patrols. So this is a key way of managing these sites. Um, they're community-led marine patrols and these civilian teams like this team from Densakau you can see here, they conduct long and short patrols a few times per week, collecting and entering their patrol data on GPS, logbooks and phones using the spatial monitoring and reporting tool. This is known as SMART. This is the collection of spatial and observational data on illegal activities and patrol efforts. And they also, the teams also importantly raise awareness of marine management and fisheries regulations while they're there and put up signboards and generally do the whole package of marine management at this scale. They're volunteer teams, really importantly, and they're supported by locally elected community committees and where possible, accompanied by fisheries law enforcement officers. So why choose this approach to management um, and why SMART? So the, in Cambodia, there is no vessel registration that's effective. There's no AIS, there's no VMS. So monitoring and surveillance, let alone control is, of fisheries and illegal fishing is very difficult. There's limited funding and capacity. These distant locations are quite remote. Um, but also more positively, there is this community fishery or community-led governance structure that our partnerships are working within to support this marine management. And even more importantly, there's local buy-in. These teams are very keen to get out there and manage their marine sites, and they're happily supported by local fisheries enforcement officers. So smart patrols themselves what actually are they and what do they, how do they take place? So number one, community teams in Cambodia get out onto the water in these very small boats. They can conduct the patrols and collect data on their GPS and mobiles, um, on infractions, on locations, on actions taken, patrol effort and more. And they enter this into the smart system. This is often done by support officers, uh, local government officers, alongside the community. And within the SMART tool, and that's section two here on the slides, they enter and visualize the data within the SMART software. The SMART software then produces um, defined reports, um, really simple reporting and visualization. And this, this data is then shared and um, worked together during monthly meetings with communities um, to discuss what worked, what didn't, and how to adapt patrols. And number four, the data is used to adapt patrols, but importantly also can be used to inform regulations. So Italian policymakers and fisheries managers, what is actually going on in the site. So that's SMART. And this is the SMART system is a pretty simple approach. It's a basic data collection approach. Um, and I'll just tell you a little bit about the successes that are uh, seen within them. So first of all, it's simple, it's free technology. And in Cambodia, at least in this context, it's been really effective. In the Korong uh, Marine Protected Area so far, we have evidence of reduced infractions per unit effort. So this is a sign of reduced illegal activity. Um, really importantly, it shows evidence for action, transparency to the work that's being done, which has led over the last uh, six years of um, implementing or getting these patrols started in Cambodia, increased support by governments and increased financing for these community-led activities uh, by the international community. The key thing that I, I would say is in a success, but definitely needs improvement, is that the patrol strategies use the data with communities to adapt and improve uh, their patrol efforts, so where they go, how often they go, and when they go. And it also crucially shows the government what is needed and what extra support might be needed to support these community managed sites. Um, we see with the groups, it's a lot of fun to go on patrol or, or see what they're doing. There's a lot of local pride and buy-in from these community groups. And um, what I think the team is, and, and I are really proud of, is that the local government officers uh, join about 40 to 50% of the patrols. So 
actually enforcement officers going along to. And even more excitingly, excitingly, we're working with the Fisheries Administration and the Cambodian government to replicate these approaches. But what about the challenges? So some of the challenges, clearly this is really small scale. Um, it's near shore, it's weather dependent. Um, the community team also have other jobs, they're voluntary, um, and this limits their responsiveness as well of, uh, to especially larger scale illegal activity. Uh, an interesting thing is that the site can be seen as managed, so national government might put their larger scale support eventually into other areas. Um, and with the tech itself, there is the mobile tool, but it's been very hard to convert the Khmer script into this smartphone app. It's underway and it should have um, great impact and help with the smartphone-based data collection, but it's still a work in progress. And also, of course, regular training is required. Um, so there've been a really, these smart systems Systems, these smart patrols, they've been a very effective tool in Cambodia, but they do have their limits. And uh, to look at how to improve management enforcement at the site, we also looked at some other forms of data to help inform management. We looked at social perceptions data and satellite data too, and looked at how these might actually be triangulated to support uh, communities in their marine management. So just before I tell the final slide on learning, um, I'd like to share a little bit about these three types of data, uh, data sources and how they've helped. So the smart patrol data, it's, it's cheap and it provides this transparency and it can be really led by communities um, and used to empower communities to adapt their patrols based on what they see at the sites and what evidence there is um, on the summarized data reports. We also, um, are looking at their social perceptions data. Now, this is really important. Um, we found this exceptionally informative. Um, we looked at knowledge, attitudes, and perceptions of community members, both fishers, non-fishers, tourism sector, to marine management, and also did participatory mapping uh, with these groups to look at perceived locations of patrols and illegal fishing. And this really showed, helped inform the community-based patrols um, on where awareness gaps, where awareness gaps are. Um, where, uh, how we need to adapt strategies like randomizing time and location because people know where patrols are happening. So it was a very effective tool to complement the smart patrol data. And the third data type we used was Ocean Mind uh, supported us in doing a uh, vessel analysis across Cambodia's EEZ and these specific sites. Um, they did a multi-sensor vessel analysis looking at large and medium scale vessels and this really helped show us um, data at scale and it, it removed the patrol and location bias that smart patrol data and community data can sometimes have and showed really high risk areas which the government um, can then act upon supporting uh, these especially the more distant remote areas uh, where higher level of illegal fishing is happening so what have we learned from all of this? So, I mean, firstly, over the last six years of trialing these smart patrols in Cambodia with the communities, we found that the data and the patrols themselves can really empower communities in marine management in this context. Uh, what we're also finding is that it's not a simple uh, data sharing management and learning process. There's a significant amount of effort and procedure still needed so that this data is converted into learning in a more timely and effective way uh, with communities so they can off their own um, off their own energy and ability at the sites to adapt patrol strategies and also alert higher level enforcement teams. Right now it is not the most responsive tool. Um, and lastly, combining um, different data types perhaps um, less regularly uh, depending on budgets, but looking at social perceptions data from others uh, living in the areas and also combining that with satellite data to look at the uh, medium to large scale fishing situation. This is really complementary to the SNART data and patrols and helpful in improving communities in their marine management. So that's everything for me. I'm really looking forward to discussion later and hearing uh, your experiences too. So thanks everyone um, for this presentation and this webinar. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, mm -hmm. It's really interesting to see how uh, a different kind of data to what we usually think about is being used. Um, once again, I'd encourage um, everybody watching to add questions into the chat so we can uh, ask them to Marianne a little bit later. 
Um, but now we're going to move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Lucy Kay. She's based in Scotland in the United Kingdom. Lucy is MPA Project Officer for the Community of Arran Seabed Trust, or COAST. Lucy has an array of experience working on MPAs and marine management, both in the United Kingdom and further afield. And she's currently supporting COAST to develop a community-led plan for the South Arran MPA. Over to you, Lucy. Hello everybody, I hope you can hear me okay and greetings from Scotland and thank you very much to Blue Ventures for the opportunity to be able to share some of uh, Coast's uh, data journey with you and things that, things that we're learning on the way. I'm going to start by just giving you a very brief introduction to, to how Coast came into being um, and then I'm going to kind of uh, just share with you some of the experiences of how Coast has used data um, since it was set up. Um, and some of our current data challenges uh, that we're trying to deal with. And when I'm referring to data in the presentation, I'm really um, focusing particularly on data about marine habitats and species. So where are we? Um, well, Arran is a Scottish island. Uh, we're located in the southwest part of Scotland, the northern part of the United Kingdom. Uh, and we're in a marine region called the Firth of Clyde. Um, which is shown in the green hatch on this map. Now, this area used to be an incredibly important area for fisheries with really abundant populations of commercially important fin fish stocks. Um, but very sadly, through the 1960s into the 1980s, a combination of a series of poor fisheries management decisions and also the opening up of areas to uh, bottom trawling and dredging which destroyed marine habitats in the area, there was an absolutely catastrophic uh, collapse of the fin fish fisheries in this area. And you can see that in the top graph on this slide, which, which sort of documents the, the reductions in landings of a number of the commercially important fish species over time. And on Arran, the local people on Arran was, was experiencing this collapse for themselves. Um, and you can see this in the bottom graph on this slide. There used to be a, an angling competition, so a rod and line fishing competition in one of the villages on Arran, Lamlash. Um, but you can see that the, the catches from this festival basically mirror the collapse of the fish stocks in the Clyde over time until in the 1990s, the festival just stopped because there were no more fish to actually catch. So on Arran, uh, there were two local divers, Don McNeish and Howard Wood, who were witnessing this for themselves as being part of the community on Arran, but they were also obviously as divers seeing changes to the marine life in the habitats that they were diving on. And they were really shocked and horrified by this and wanted to try and do something to stop the decline and, and turn things around and restore the marine habitats. So they worked very closely with people um, in the community on Arran and established the Community of Arran Seabed Trust or COAST in 1995. Now to start with, there was really very limited marine biological data to do with the habitats around Arran. But what these two people and others had was actually their own personal observations and also visual records of things that were happening. So, you know, examples of marine life that were showing positive things and examples were showing a changed and, and degraded habitat. And they used this data to engage the community and others about the issues um, and to really try and get people on board with why something needed to be done. And in the UK, most people, and I guess this is probably similar to a lot of other countries, most people will never actually see the seabed for themselves. So it's really important to try and make issues in the marine environment real for people uh, and actually explain why something needs to be done. Now, Coast soon realised that really, in order to back up and improve their arguments for improved protection of the sea area around Arran, that they needed to become more informed about the marine habitats that were present in their area. And to do this, they became trained as sea search surveyors. Now, sea search is a UK-wide project which has been going on for over 30 years now, which trains just ordinary volunteer divers to make records of the marine habitats and marine life that they see when they're out diving. And the really great thing about this is that Sea Search actually quality assure and verify the data that's collected, and they also make it available into national UK wide databases. So the data becomes publicly available, which is great because it actually deals with this whole sort of data management aspect of it. 
but by participating in Sea Search, it really helped Coast work by building expertise within the community and enabling the community to campaign from a more informed position. Uh, being directly involved in collecting and using the data has actually really been important in helping Coast to campaign for protected areas to be established and effectively managed. Um, and the development of the skills and expertise within the community has helped them by enabling them to better understand themselves, the marine life around the island, and actually explain that to other people and show that to other people. And it's helped establish a really informed and knowledgeable group of people within the community on Arran. And this data uh, that the community collected has been re really uh, significant. It's made a really significant contribution to the establishment of protected areas on Arran. To start with, the Lamlash Bay no-take zone, which was designated in 2008. The South Arran Marine Protected Area, uh, which was designated in 2014. And also the establishment campaign for establishing uh, fisheries management measures within the South Arran Marine Protected Area, uh, which came into legal force in 2016, establishing a series of fishing zones, uh, which principally restrict and, and, and prohibit uh, dredge and trawl fisheries within the marine protected area. Another really significant area of data that has been generated um, through Coast's work is through collaborative projects with universities. So when the no-take zone was first set up, uh, one of the things Coast wanted to do was actually understand what should they be monitoring in order to track change over time once the no-take zone had been introduced and, and uh, all fishing had actually been uh, prohibited within that area. So, and this has led to a partnership with a number of universities in the UK um, to look at uh, particular populations of commercially important species, but also the benthic habitats and biodiversity generally. Uh, and over time, this has actually turned into a long-term monitoring program of the habitats and, and species. And the results from this are really exciting. They're showing um, change and increases in populations, how documenting how seabed biodiversity is recovering in some areas where the, dred the dredging has been prohibited and this is providing really important evidence for Coast to be able to use to lobby and campaign for improved protection and management of uh, the inshore waters around Arran but also for use by others evidence that such management measures can be effective to try and campaign for change elsewhere. So when I first came to work for Coast, which was back in uh, 2019, so I've not been working for Coast that long, um, it was obvious that a lot of data had been collected by Coast and through its work with others, um, but it wasn't necessarily all in one place or easily accessible by everybody uh, to make the best use of it. So we've been looking um, at how we can actually improve this. Uh, and the starting point has really been trying to just understand what we've got um, and getting all the information into a timeline of survey events um, and clarifying what data has actually been generated by these survey events over the years. So obviously that's quite a challenge because there's been a lot of work happening over the last uh, 15, 20 years or so, but also who holds that data um, and who has the ownership of it. And it also includes things like visual data such as videos and photographs that go alongside perhaps the more sort of numerical uh, habitat and species data and we're going to use this to help us do a, a form of gap analysis just to look at where we want to focus on for future survey monitoring and research. One of the other things we're doing with the data is to actually get uh, data into a GIS uh, mapping system so that we can actually view it spatially uh, and this makes such a difference because it makes the data real on a sort of geographical scale and it's something that we haven't been doing before um, and it helps us to not only kind of communicate uh, to uh, maybe people in government or work with other researchers but it's really useful tool for actually engaging people about the habitats and the distribution uh, in the sort of geographical area of the MPA. So this slide just shows data that's been collected by University of Glasgow looking at uh, fish habitat and use by juvenile fish within the South Arran MPA. 
And also, as well as getting our data in order, we're really interested to know what other data is available that helps us and helps the community on Aaron uh, in, in, uh, ma in making decisions and also sort of campaigning for, for better management of the marine areas. Um, and so I've been spending quite a bit of time looking at what data exists online in the UK. Now, we're quite fortunate in that there are quite a lot of national data portals um, that data can be viewed and in many cases can data sets can actually be downloaded but the challenge is that not all of it's in one place so uh, that's something that we're looking at to try and understand and, and document where information it's most easily to get hold of information so examples of data we've extracted in this slide on the left the car the the, the sort of more multicolor points so show data generated by coast and others and then the red dots if you can see them on the screen that is actually part of a national data set set which is showing uh benthic uh seabed records collected through surveys by government and and, and others over the years that's available online and on the right just showing the sort of habitat distribution of some of the marine protected area habitats within the south Aran mpa that is also data that's being downloaded from from a national data set but there is a question really i think for community groups like coast how we try and keep on top of this into the future and another thing we're looking at is making sure that habitat and species data that's collected by researchers actually um, is widely available. Obviously, data becomes available through papers and reports that are produced, but quite often we have examples of habitat and species data that we'd like to be make, make more widely available within national data sets in the UK. And so we're currently working with uh, researchers and with the C-Search project again that I mentioned earlier to see how we might be able to capture this data so that it becomes more widely available for others to help um, them use it in decision making in the future. And there's also a question as well of sorting out our existing data is actually how do we want to try and move forward to manage and make best use of our data into the future. So in Scotland, Coast is one of 18 coastal groups who are connected via the coastal communities network, all of whom are working to um, secure better management and protection for their own local sea areas. Um, and the question of future data management is something that these groups are working on with the help of the Nature Conservation Advisor within Scotland, Nature Scott, as part of a community-led marine monitoring project. So this is the, uh, the final slide of the presentation. Uh, and in putting together the presentation, it's really made me think about actually, you know, the data that Coast has used and is generating, what we're learning from it and how we are making use of it to empower our work and, and what options are available to us in the future, how we make best use of it as we, as we go forward. So there's just a few things I wanted to highlight to finish. Um, the nature of the data that Coast has used that has been helped empower the community's um, campaigns and work over the years takes many different formats. And it's not just the scientific data. As I said right at the start, visual data is really important, whether that's images or videos or even you know, graphic representations of the data, particularly to get messages across. And I don't think we necessarily always see this as data. And quite a lot of our current data management systems aren't that good at capturing and archiving it. So that's something we need to look at. The other thing is, is that um, Coast data journey has evolved over time uh, and the, the reasons why data has been collected and used to have evolved with the work uh, of the organisation. And we now need to think strategically how are, we want to address the future data needs um, and, and actually be effective in managing and using our data going into the, into the future. And as part of this, as I mentioned, is understanding what other data exists where and try and help others to understand that as well. And I think the handling, storage and managing data is quite a challenge um, for a community group such as Coast. Um, and we need to really look at how we can work with others most effectively um, to enable to support the community to enable to do this most effic efficiently and effectively. And I think there's also a question maybe in making data public that have been generated by community groups, issues around the sensitivity of that data and, and how that is addressed. And ultimately, we want the data to empower our work and help us achieve our immediate goals and longer term aims. Um, and there's a question around how, how can we be successful in, in getting that data recognised and used by decision makers uh, so that future decisions about policy and management action support community based action uh, for better management of our MPAs. 
And that's it. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about uh, the work that we've been doing on coast and look forward to the discussion later. Thank you very much, Nisi. I mean, sorry, Lucy. Um, I think your uh, citizen sciences are particularly de dedicated to go into that cold water in Scotland. Um, it, sound, it sounds wonderful, but a little bit uncomfortable. Um, now over to our final speaker. Uh, she's in Indonesia, Nusi Musarati from Fulkani. Fulkani is a community NGO based in Kaladupa, Wakatobi in Southeast Sulawesi, and it's where Nusi was born. Nusi is a project leader for several projects with Fulkani, including an octopus fisheries management project. Over to you, Nusi. Thank you, Abby. Uh, I hope my voice is clear now. Uh, so, my name is uh, Mursiati. Hello, everyone. Um, but everyone call me Nusi. I stay in Wakatobi. I work with uh, Fulkani. Uh, it's, uh, uh, a partner of uh, BV. So today I will share how we do fisheries data feedback with the communities in Wakatobi to uh, bring community the decision making to manage their octopus fisheries. Um, the, the main part of our data feedback is make sure about ownership uh, of this data. So. We, we have to make sure when, when we start this project, we never know about the octopus. Everything come from community. Like they have long uh, experience with their fisheries. They collect the data, they measure the octopus. So before we start, we make sure that the data owner is a community. So it's our responsibility to bring back the data to the community. And then uh, next step is uh, who needs who needs the data. Uh, we're just thinking that everyone in the community needs the data. Like uh, let's say, by they need the data to manage their business. How how much they need to uh, prepare their budget to buying octopus. Uh, local government need a. Uh, the data to poli uh, policy making and also fishers and uh, other uh, community member for fishers they they just need uh, how much they got octopus in a season and then how how much the, uh, they get income from this octopus uh, but uh, something uh, miss when we start this uh, data collection we we not yet import uh, their interest in, in our variable. So we forget the income. And then that at the time we changing the variable, we put their interest to know how much they get income from uh, this uh, octopus fishing. We really confused with a complicated data result. And then for that, we think that as the owner, community need understand what they have, what are changing in their uh, resources. Fisher uh, uh, think that it's so complicated, even us in Forkan, it's so complicated uh, data. So we try to changing the data to make it simpler to community to understand what they have. Do they need to changing something or something changing in their fisheries? That's why we changing like this one, uh, like uh, from the complicated data to simplify to make community easy to understand what they have donate to change changing something or no then we made uh like uh what we say <laughs> in wakatobi maybe like a small pad away like a pattern to to manage this uh, feedback data so we don't uh, we don't to be hurry to bring community decide what they need to do with their fisheries and and we make like a pattern by the way to first uh like what we say <laughs> like we set up the goals each uh 
feedback data season. First step, we present the octopus data catch to prove the community and encourage their self esteem. Like when we start, they don't believe themselves that they can uh, do data collecting and then they, they can understand their visitors by themselves. They always like, um, they, they doubt that they can do it, how we can do it. That's why when we start, we say that no one from Portani it's uh, come from fisheries. Uh, so we say that we can learn together and then we bring back it to them. And then after, after the first uh, feedback data, we ask them, what do you need from data fisheries? It's enough to you or no? So they give us uh, some suggest like, uh, we need to know how much uh, the income from our uh, octopus fishing, how, how big, the biggest one. So, and then which one the favorite site. So we put a uh, more variable in uh, our data, like uh, 10 people with the biggest catches, 10 uh, sites with the biggest uh, uh, octopus productivity like that. And then second, we build community understanding regarding data set, uh, data trends. We put a uh, six data catches and then show them how how much they get big octopus, uh, how much they get uh, small octopus, and then what they their benefit when they get bigger octopus if we compare with a, a small octopus according to second feedback data season, they determine to management planning. We ask them which one you choose, it's your resources. So you can choose to destroy your fisheries or manage your fisheries. It's depending on com uh, our community like that. So we, we, we arrange like, like uh, a game about a temporal crossover and spillover and then offer fishing so that it can bring them to uh, realize what they need to changing in their fisheries uh, management. And after deciding temporary crossover as a, a management planning, we determine a closer uh, duration, site and the rule based on local wisdom. Determine closer dura duration. Uh, it's important to link between the trend when community understand which uh, part or which time they catch a small octopus. Mostly, they will they will decide what they will do. They need a more income, more bigger octopus, based on the uh, the data. And then we ask them. Even the term, not only, not only like, uh, because in Wakatobi they have uh, like a uh, long, long drama with uh, closure. So we changing the term about a closure. We say it uh, like a, a season, harvest season for octopus in in Wakatobi. We we say that no one need to say that it's closure. It's uh, like a temporary closure. It's a uh, uh, like forbidden to say because community have a uh, different different uh, meaning if we say uh, closer and then we working with a uh, traditional leader to set up the regulation because uh, uh, this is uh, this area temporary closer is a uh, local uh, so we build a system we build the role with the community based on the local wisdom and then the important part is uh, how the community decide to determine community surveillance system uh, it's not easy in Indonesia if we say like a uh, community surveillance because uh, mostly yeah, they need a special group to surveillance but in this uh, case they agreed to like uh, give everyone responsibility community member not only the fish uh, like octopus fisher but also uh, all the people in this uh, village even women, uh, seaweed farming, and other fisher like uh, gillnet fishing, fisher something like that. 
everyone and then this decide uh, the area nearby their village so easy to controlling uh, the closure area and important part is because uh, build understanding between community members and neighboring villages like that in darawa uh, where we have a yeah a closer area this is open access so we need to build a uh, community member need to build understanding between them and and also their uh, uh, neighboring villages and and uh, next after closer we need to quick data analysis after opening because community need to see the result and for this we need capture all the community recommendation like after first uh, closer women say that we need uh, a special ar uh, area to women so we capture it and then the second uh, closer we have uh, another area especially for women facing uh, ground and For all of uh, feedback data season in Wakatobi, we have main principle things. Uh, first is uh, uh, respect local wisdom and local knowledge. They know actually, they know the circle of octopus, but they haven't any data to prove it. So mess, mess the data and then their local wisdom, it's better way. So con consider community interest as a part of research, uh, research data. Sometimes, so respect their knowledge, encourage their need. It's, it's important to be uh, a part in our research data because community know what they have. And circle of circle life of octopus, every time we do, we need to share it. Everyone we go, we need to share it because they, uh, Circle of octopus community more understand how long they need to to close an area, and also the community they have uh, their own system, so we don't need to changing their system in the community, and also community member we can uh, for everyone contribute in this uh, closure in this management because they are they have equal rights to accessibility to their resources. I think that all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much from Wakatobi. <laughs> Thank you, Nisi. And it's really great to see you using new techniques like games and posters to communicate uh, the fishery with the community. Um, now it's time to hand over to my colleague, Hannah, who's going to share some of the questions that we've had from our audience. I'm on mute. Technology. Um, thanks, Abby. Um, I really enjoyed seeing all of those presentations and um, lots of different examples. I often find myself wading in just fisheries data, so it's nice to see examples of patrols as well and habitat. Um, so I'd like to invite our speakers up. Um, I have some questions for them. I've been taking mm -hmm. furious notes during the talks, so hopefully I can ask some good questions for you. Um, Let's see. So I guess I will start with you, Marianne. Um, a question from Katie. Um, are there any challenges with making smart, accessible, and understandable at the community level? Yep. Um, can I check? I'm still online. Yes, <laughs> Great. you are. I can. Um, thanks, Katie, for the question. Really good question. Yep, absolutely. There are definitely still challenges in making smart, accessible, and understandable. I mean, I do, I do think it's still an effective tool because it's a really simple system to visualize the data without needing to have a science trained individual or even an Excel trained individual to help visualize the data or the summaries um, and create the evidence. But the challenge as I think both um, my the presenters have um, also said, the challenge is the ownership of the data itself and the actual empowerment of the community because the community collected data is submitted to the provincial government, the national government, and by proxy NGOs like ourselves. And the reports are very easily created, but it still has required some training, and that's currently sitting with uh, local government rather than in communities. 
um, these reports and data is then shared and discussed with communities in um, engaging workshops and um, in community-led spaces. But it is not the communities who are summarizing and visualizing the data themselves. Um, part of this is due to the context in Cambodia. There's a strong working relationship between communities and government, and there's buy-in from government in supporting this process. So we have to also be quite respectful that government wants to see the data. Um, and NGOs play a little bit of a diplomatic role there. But another is that the communities, um, there's uh, the level of education and technical capacity is very low and communities have directly requested this technical support or middleman summarizing of data and findings, um, which is something that the NGOs often support with. Um, but yeah, it's the middleman data management does limit um, how empowering the data is. And we'd love to look at the different pathways like Nusi mentioned of sharing the findings um, and we are moving towards smart mobile which is has more real-time sharing and visualization as relevant to communities um, but even just getting this started is requiring technical support outside of communities so it'll be a few more months before we're starting to see that um, real accessibility uh, at the community level great thanks Marianne. it seems like you've got a really wide range of information to pull on to communicate as well um, I have a related question for Lucy um, from Chris. So this is on a similar topic. Um, he says there are a significant amount of data available for Coast. And um, so he's interested to find out to what degree fishers are engaging with the data themselves and what they see as key value propositions. Well, from very early on, um, Coast uh, was talking with local um, fishers in the Clyde region, you know, uh, in all the early work in terms of setting up the the no take zone to start with so we have kind of i, I guess broadly there are kind of two main groups of fishers there's those uh, who operate mobile fishing gear and those who are operating static gear which is primarily pots um uh, or, or called creels for for crustaceans um so fishermen have been very closely involved with coast over time the relationship has been variable depending on the issues at the time i guess um, but we work very closely with some of the local fishermen to actually undertake some of the research work so some of them uh, of the local fishermen have been um, uh, have been integral to us actually being able to do some of the research because it's actually done by deploying fishing gear from fishing vessels and obviously they have the knowledge and expertise of how to do that so they're very closely mm -hmm. involved in in the results of work that's coming out of those particular studies so um but with other fishermen obviously mobile fishing uh, fishing um the mobile fishing industry has actually been excluded from most of the MPA, so they have a, a slightly maybe different view uh, of aspects of the marine protected area. Um, and I think there's questions about how we could work more effectively with them into the future in the areas where things like trawl fishing for prawns still happens. Great, thanks. Um, and Nuthi, um, question from Tongi. Um, it's great to hear about the empowerment community feel in the data process. Do you think this had an effect on their relationships with government staff or how government perceive the community roles in management? Oh, sorry, I've got the name completely wrong for that question. I'm sorry. <laughs> Nisi, can you hear? Oh, I think we maybe have lost Nusi. Um, so it's, oh. Hello. Hey, can you hear the question, Nusi? Yep. Hello. Uh, it's clear. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, for as in uh, for community empowerment, like uh, uh, it uh, have effect to community like uh, so after a long process uh, in Wakatobi for community in uh, uh, Darawa at the first uh, site uh, like for closure in Darawa we have a big impact for fis uh, fisheries uh, especially for octopus in Darawa because uh, the data 
what we have is the first data in Wakatobi about a uh, octopus fisheries. So from this data, community can discuss with uh, not only for local government in village level, but now they they brave to discuss with a fisheries department in a uh, regency level that we need to something changing in our fisheries. We need to put uh, octopus as a part of uh, Wakatobi fisheries. We need a special policy for our octopus fisheries. So now it's a uh, fisheries department put a uh, temporary clusters uh, as a main program in their uh, department and they put it like a temporary because a community put temporary cluster every year it's a uh, put uh, also by fisheries department as an annual uh, program in their in their uh, department and uh, now we are working together with fisheries department to build up uh, the system how to connecting uh, four main island we have a fisheries uh, octopus data in Wakatobi, like that. Thank you. Thanks, Nisi. Um, we have a final question for all of you. Um, we're running out of time, so if you can make it brief, that would be great. Um, so it's actually from Tangi this time. I'm really sorry, Timo. Um, so when discussing your respective data and findings with the people that you work with, um, are the data challenged at all by community members, fishers or others, or is it widely accepted and trusted? Um, anyone, <laughs> feel free to jump in. Um, I think from Coast perspective, I think um, data has been widely shared with the community and others from right from the get go. Um, and I think that the, the is you know data's discussed and you know and there's questioning around data but i think um in gen you know so there's a kind of like a healthy discussion around data mm -hmm. um but i think people um because people are kept informed about the work that's happening and the results that are coming out um that people have seen this journey of, of kind of, of of sort of data collection and so on the whole there's there's a lot of support and, and i think trust in the community for the data that is being collected but also healthy sort of discussions around the findings um of that the data the, the data is producing and Marianne, do you find something similar um, or have you had quite a different experience? No, I think um, very similar in terms of keeping community informed uh, has been the key way for um, it to be generally accepted. Uh, I think that when, when we're sharing data, it's we're lucky in Cambodia that I think because of just the trust in us or in the team um, that is, has been gained by just being present over the years, um, being reliable, but most importantly, listening hearing and discussing the data regularly with communities has been mm -hmm. really effective. In that. But conversely, we've found it really difficult because we've been so focused on communities and fishers um, and we've got great relationships there in the Korong Marine National Park, we've not done as well, or us as a collective partnership hasn't done as well in sharing information and gaining the trust of, for example, the more transient tourism sector. Uh, in the site. So while we have good trust and relationships with these community groups, local government, village chiefs um, and authorities, we there is less trust in from the tourism sector, um, mainly because um, we've been so focused on the fisheries and the fisher groups um, and uh, also because they're quite transient. So, you know, we're on a 10 year 10 year cycle of learning and they often come in for maybe one or two years uh, for uh, tourism businesses so that's been a challenge tough yeah and I suppose you've got to maintain very regular contact to be able to build yeah. that trust yeah um and Nusi, what are your thoughts do you feel like the fishers or the broader community trust the data or do they feel they have a different experience um for us in uh, wakatobi actually uh they 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 have their experience they like uh between uh during june to september they catch a lot of 
uh, small octopus and then when they see the, the data it give give them more more uh confident that they have they have they have experienced it's uh, like a uh, proof by the data so it's a uh, it's a uh, match with between their experience and then uh, the data so it's uh, easy to community but the, the challenge is how to changing the scientific data to simplify to easy to community yeah. understand the data and then pair it with community member because the important parts it's not only the octopus feature as the main target but the main target actually a community member because uh, decision making not only made by uh, the fishers but all of the community member because uh, they their fishing ground in the same area they uh, seaweed farming in the same area and there are also they get everything from their uh, fishing ground so we need to give them space between them from the data and uh, understand the data and then uh, share the local uh, government community member woman group and the, we have special thing in wakatobi to in uh, like community interest not only income but also how from the data they can realize with one female octopus and male octopus it's like a key part to discuss about the data uh, that's uh, all great thanks very much all um for answering those questions i believe they will remain on our YouTube um, link. So if you wanted to go back and answer, we might be able to do that. Um, I'm sorry, I couldn't get around to more questions, but I will hand over to Abby now to wrap up the session. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. And thanks again to our great speakers and those of you that submitted questions. That brings us to the end of the first part of this webinar. For those of you who pre-registered for the workshop, um, we're now inviting you to discuss these issues in greater depth. There'll be a facilitator to guide the conversation in each group, uh, but we invite you to share your ideas and experiences openly so that everyone can benefit from all of the experience and wisdom that's in this audience. While we sort you into groups, you'll be able to enjoy some short videos. Additionally, before we all split up, we've got a couple of more resources that we'd like to share with you today. Firstly, if you'd like to learn more about how technology can be used in community data collection and connect to others and make conversation in this area, please visit the recently launched Small Scale Fisheries Hub and join the ICT for Fisheries group. As well as that, you can find out more about the Small Scale Fisheries Hub as a whole um, at their launch parties next Wednesday, and you can find a link to the hub in the comments. Finally, have a look out for a toolkit that's coming soon um, from us, which details Blue Ventures and our partners' best practice practices and learning around data literacy and data feedback with communities. But it's time to join the discussion groups now. There's a link in the live on the live feed page that should take you there, or if you strug are struggling, there's one in your registration email as well. So thanks again for everybody that's joined, and hopefully we'll see you in part two. It's time to click the link to join now.